Something at some stage you would have all seen is on your Garmin watches or your wearable devices, a VO2 max numbers come up. Now it's something that we can't actually directly measure all the time in the field and it's typically measured only in a lab. So how can companies like Garmin actually estimate your VO2 max and is it an accurate measure to be able to track your performance over time? This video we're gonna break down exactly how they do it and take you through what you need to know about VO2 max being estimated on your wearable device. Let's get into it. Hey guys, Nick here. Welcome back to the channel, talking everything science of endurance and sports science in general. Thanks again for everyone who's already subscribed and given some feedback on the channel. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to making some more content for you in the coming weeks and coming months and having a really good uh, good time creating it as well. So it's been a really fun process so far. So looking forward to get stuck into more. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button down below. It definitely helps me um, produce some more content and also some of the feedback's been really useful in terms of some future videos. So looking forward to being able to produce some more specific pieces of content for everyone who is uh, interested uh, out there. So if you do have any specific questions you want answered around endurance performance or sports science, feel free to leave them in the comments and I'm happy to jump on in a video in the future and answer those ones specifically for you. But for today's video, like I said in the intro, it's all about Garmin watches, wearable technology, things like that that we're wearing day to day, swimming, cycling, running. How does that actually estimate VO2 max? And is it an accurate measure that we can use uh, day to day in terms of monitoring our performance? So what I want to break down first is a couple of key principles. And the first one is the relationship between oxygen consumption and heart rate. And this is really the core of what companies like Garmin are doing to be able to understand what VO2 max is. I'm gonna put up a graph uh, on the screen right about here uh, that is gonna show the relationship between oxygen consumption, so VO2 or volume of oxygen, uh, and our heart rate as exercise intensity increases. And what you notice with this graph is that it's a quite linear progression. So as heart rate increases or as exercise intensity increases, should I say, we get an increase in oxygen consumption, so our VO2, but we also get an increase in heart rate. So this is happening in a really linear fashion, so you're a straight line as you can see on the graph, and it's pretty consistent. Um, this is a, a mock-up graph, but if we look at actual VO2 data, I'm gonna chuck up some of mine on the screen now. What we can actually see is the progression's exactly the same, and it's a very, very good correlation. So when we're talking about correlations, something I'll quickly mention now, is we get an equation for the slope of the line, and basically that tells us how where all the points are in terms of the data points we collect throughout the test, how closely related they are to that line. And it gives us what we call an R value. So that, that R value is, is essentially really critical in identifying is it a strong correlation or is it a weak correlation? So how, how effective um, is this line for predicting one of the other variables? So in this circumstance, how effective is heart rate uh, as, a, as a metric uh, of our intensity and our metric of our training in predicting our oxygen consumption of VO2 max. And because we get this really linear line, we get an R value of close to 0 0.9, 0 0.95, almost one. And a one, an R value of one would be a perfect correlation. Uh, every increase in heart rate would equal an, e uh, an equivalent increase in oxygen consumption the entire test. And we, we follow that dead line straight. You can see a bit of variance in my data uh, that's up on the screen. You can see it sort of go either side of the line, but it's very tightly Woven, in, woven around that that sort of linear line, which tells us the, the, the correlation is really, really close. So oxygen consumption and heart rate are very heavily linked. And it makes sense. If you've gone back uh, and watched the video I did the other day about what is VO2 max and the def definition of it, I'm gonna link it above uh, so you can click on that and also in the description. If you haven't watched it, go check that one out before you go any further to understand a bit more about what VO2 max is before we get into uh, sort of what Garmin is doing. The type of thing, if you understand from that, we, we have these linking systems. So what is dictated by the ability to transport the oxygen around the system from a cardiovascular perspective, heart rate, what's happening in the blood, etc., is then gonna dictate how much oxygen we can use at the working muscle. So they are interlinked. It's one part of the equation uh, of, of VO2 overall. So therefore, we, this linear progression is no real surprises. From this information, how is, how is Garmin collecting it? And what we've got is typically most athletes are gonna have access to one of the following, or, or if not a couple, at least a, some sort of wearable device like a GPS watch, majority of athletes are gonna have one of those, but then also something like a heart rate strap is gonna be really critical to get accurate heart rate data. Optical sensors, so the wrist-based ones, and I can do a separate video talking about the differences between a chest strap and an optical um, optical sensor. The wrist-based ones can be a bit up and down, and as most people would know, they, they're sometimes not completely accurate. I typically prefer using the chest strap just from an accuracy perspective, and like I said, I'm not gonna talk about that too much today, but I'll split it up into a video coming soon about why uh, why the chest straps might be a bit more accurate. If we can get accurate GPS data or accurate pacing data, wattage uh, from power meters on your bike, uh, swim data from stroke, etc., and we're able to get the heart rate to go with it, 
we've then got a couple of metrics to start mapping out this linear progression. And this is all Garmin is doing. It's just farming through your training sessions, collecting all of your data at different intensities. So you go out and maybe you go out and do a long, slow ride on a Saturday, two hours of just very easy base case. It gets an understanding of your speed, what your heart rate was like for that speed. Later in the week, maybe you do a high intensity interval session where you're working at a much higher, uh, higher intensity from a power perspective. You're going at a faster speed or a faster estimated speed based if you're on a tr smart trainer, for example. But then it maps your heart rate to that as well. And the same happens for the run, same happens for the swim if you've got the heart rate metric in the swim with those new Garmin tri straps being able to be worn in the water as well, which is kind of cool. As long as it can get accurate data there, that's majority of the majority of the puzzle solved. That's essentially the core of how Garmin is understanding what your VO2 max is. The added accuracy then comes from actually determining a number is what you've input into Garmin Connect. And this is also a critical part of the equation that I talk about with athletes a lot, is we need to make sure that your information in Garmin Connect is is the right information. You've got the correct height, you've got the correct age, you've got the correct gender. It's something that a lot of athletes might just skip over and rush through, but then also weight is a critical one. So all of those, those characteristics are key because then the algorithm will align you to your population specific group. So it'll look at, all right, you've been doing some running sessions, your X number of years, years of age, you're this height and this weight based on what we typically see what is your heart rate looking like what is your pacing looking like map it all out that's how we get our vo2 max result and in most cases it's pretty accurate so when we do uh, athlete testing in a lab circumstance put them on a treadmill mask them up with the vo2 equipment we typically see a pretty pretty close relationship between what garmin is estimating and what the vo2 equipment is telling us if all those variables are being measured accurately and if we've got the right information into Garmin Connect in the first place in terms of population statistics. Putting all that together, we, we get a difference of, usually it's anywhere between sort of even as small as one mil per kilo per minute, which is quite a small um, small variance, maybe up to sort of five mils, mils per kilo per minute from a VO2 perspective. So very small uh, variance, which is pretty good. So overall we can say it's a, it's a reasonably good measure for, for tracking over time. The one thing I will say with it though is that it can be a little bit skewed by the type of training you do. And I'll give a few examples. If we look at someone like an ultra runner who typically might do a large amount of their training as a long, slow volume, and then add in maybe some bits and pieces of higher intensity here and there, but it's not really a key part of their program. Typically what we find is that their VO2 max might actually be on the lower end of the spectrum from a, from a Garmin estimating perspective, because the high intensity just isn't there to balance the upper end and give us that information at at higher, um, higher intensities and higher workloads. So the, the graph is almost skewed to the lower end. So the Garmin just recognizes, oh, well, you don't really do much faster than four minute K pace or, or 430 pace or five, five minute K pace, whatever your, your, your long slow runs are at. And you're typically around these heart rates, well, there's not much fitness above that. So this is roughly, this must be sort of your optimal peak fitness. Maybe we add a little bit on. Flip side of things, if we take someone who does a lot of short distance stuff, so your 5K runner or less, team sport athletes, etc. typically we see the VO2 max rating can be a little bit skewed higher because it, it goes up and it sees you working at high intensity all the time, holding holding high um, heart rate over that, that high intensity and it matches up and goes, all right, probably a little bit fitter than maybe someone at the bottom end. So it might skew it above rather than skew it below. It could also work the opposite direction. So the long, slow runners, because they've got such great base, it actually might... Um, boost it up a little bit going, oh, you've got really good aerobic fitness. So therefore your VO2 is going to be higher just because of the long slow component because your heart rates are really low for a, for a moderate intensity. Team sport athlete, the short distance athlete might do a lot of high intensity, not a, long, not a lot of long slow. Therefore it says, well, your aerobic capacity is not really existent. We're going to scale you back. Take it with a bit of grain of salt because depending on what your training program is like, it can influence what the Garmin rating is going to be as well. But overall, it's going to get a pretty accurate result as long as you've got a pretty well-balanced training program and as long as you're getting accurate data input into the equation, you're going to come out with a pretty good, good outcome overall. Something I will say as a final note on the Garmin estimation is don't look at it day to day. Something that a lot of athletes fall into the trap of is at the end of each session, looking at their VO2 max and seeing or on their Garmin and saying, oh, has it improved? Has it improved? I'd look at it as an average across the week and then compare that week to six weeks time. Uh, and you can actually go into the, the Garmin Connect app and I might put it up on the screen here, the little screen recording I did and showing you where you can go into it. You head into the app, you can go through and have a look at what your VO2 max is currently for, for your, your bike, your run, etc. But then you can also have a look at what it has been over four weeks, over a six week period, etc. And you can start to compare it. Even if you want to do your own analysis, note some of those down, even in depending on how technical you want to get, you want to get into Excel and, and write it all down and you just write it on a piece of paper or just take a simple data point and go, all right, what's a what's a common session I do? Maybe it's a monofartlek, maybe it's a 1K repeat type session. 
What was my VO2 max saying at the end of that? And in six weeks time, what is it saying then? Have I improved? That's probably a better way of looking at it rather than just day to day or session to session, because it could vary. You have a bit of fatigue, you don't perform as well in the session. Maybe it's a case of VO2 starts to drop a bit, or like I said, the type of session might actually dictate what what goes into that equation and, and sort of how it updates as well. That's a quick breakdown of how Garmin understand or estimate your VO2 max overall. Does a pretty good job, but there are a lot more accurate ways of doing it, like going into a lab and actually getting physically tested. So it's, it, it's, it's something that it's not measuring your oxygen consumption. It is an educated guess. So we have to keep that in mind when we are looking at numbers and metrics like this. But for the most part, the algorithm so far and, and how they've developed it is reasonably good. And in comparison to lab testing, does a pretty good job. It's not completely accurate, but it gets you 85% of the way there. So hopefully you found this video useful. If you have, please hit the subscribe button uh, and comment below anything you want me to cover in future videos. Like I said at the beginning, really helpful to hear some of that feedback already, which has been great and appreciate the support for those who have followed already. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and we'll see you in the next one.